Don't get it with some me astro, get it without one. Right. Yeah. 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 All right, we're nearly, we're nearly ready now. You can have the speakers off. Bernard? Yes. You know a lad called Jonathan Hayes? He uh, went to the club when it was in Bramall about 25 years ago. You can have two, that's enough. Yeah, the problem is this. I can't remember the name. Right, he's just joined Facebook, but he knows you pretty well. Right. Don't right, Hayes. Or oh, knows of him. <laughs> right, good evening, everybody. Can, can, you, can you all hear us? Yeah, go on, Nigel. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody, Anybody can't, can't hear us, shout now. What? Exactly. exactly. Right. right, thanks, Neil. I knew it you that came up with that one. <laughs> and that a little ruse. Right, right. okay. Um, Welcome back, Carsten. Um, it must seem a bit like deja vu, this. Yeah. But uh, you know, see now that uh, he was here in September to do the same thing. But thankfully, we've got a few more people here to uh, see the uh, presentation about QO100 uh, from the suburbs this evening. Um, but before we do, um, you might have all noticed that it's been described as the uh, G3 FYE Memorial Lecture. And the reason for that is that uh, many, many moons ago, we used to have every year, and I'm sure Bernard will remember this, a meeting uh, each year to remember Ray Phillips' G3 FYE. G3 FYE uh, was the long-term secretary of the society, and along with a few others, including uh, G6UQ and uh, G2ARX, reformed the society in the early 50s after the uh, uh, the war years. So it's uh, down to him, really, and his mates that we're all here tonight. So we've had a few interesting talks, and I say one year, one talk each year is dedicated to uh, uh, the memory of Ray Phillips. We haven't had one of these for a while. I thought it was about time that we actually uh, uh, did, uh, did so again. So thankfully, the uh, talks are usually radio related, uh, specifically radio related, and it's nice to see uh, Carsten has been the obvious example of that because it's uh, an interesting radio topic that I'm sure many of you will enjoy this evening. Uh, one interesting thing, whilst I was looking into Ray Phillips and uh, you know the history of the society was that uh, at the outset they used to have buzzer sessions and this is going back to the 1920s where they all used to get together and play Morse code and of course we've got uh, Evan and Brian doing exactly the same thing here keeping the tradition going so well done guys you don't look a hundred but there you go <laughs> All right. and, I, and, I, and I see they've actually corded the sweets that uh, Carson has provided so uh, oops there we go there's a big there's a guilty subject who's now passing it around so without further ado I was I think it's time to uh, welcome Carson back and say thank you very much he's a nice uh, Nice picture of himself on the uh, screen here, playing in the snow. So uh, over to you, Carsten. Okay, then. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this presentation. This doesn't work, obviously, now, because I didn't switch it on. <laughs> and the title, Nigel suggested, QO100 from the suburbs, but really, why from the suburbs, you can do it almost anywhere. So um, if you're not into satellites at all, you might wonder what this QO100 is. So we're going to start with that, with an introduction. Um, the frequencies and modes that you can use on it, the equipment that you need. Then I'll uh, go a bit over my station and how I got there. 
some operating, what you can um, hear, what you can work on the satellite, and some ideas for next steps. So let's dive right into the introduction. What is Q100? It's Qatar Oscar 100. So um, satellites, amateur radio satellites can get a number assigned by the AMSAT uh, in, the, in North America. You have to apply for it. And then they get a number and also some sort of pre prefix. So there's Fuji, Oscar, I don't know, the number 42. Um, and other names or just um, amateur Oscar 100. And Oscar stands for orbital satellite carrying, carrying amateur radio. This specific one is special in that it's a geostationary satellite. So um, it orbits the Earth with the same speed as the Earth rotates. So for us, it looks like it's um, stationary on uh, over some point on the Earth, which is very useful because if you are in the footprint, then you can uh, reach it any time of the day. It's been built as a cooperation between AMSAT in Germany, the Qatari Amateur Radio Society, and for the hardware, the uh, Qatar Satellite Company. So it's piggybacked or part of really um, a commercial satellite uh, called SHIL Sat 2. Um, SHIL is um, the Arabic name of Canopus, which is a star um, over the Middle East. Um, and it's got a linear transponder. That means what you get put in, you will get out. <clears throat> the more power you get uh, put in, the more power it will return um, back to you. But different to uh, an FM relay um, oops, where um, the transmitter basically has a constant, constant power and it's just... If you're too weak, um, you'll just get some noise, but the, uh, the, the output of the, of the repeater is going to be the same. So that's all very interesting and unique. It's the only uh, geostationary satellites that we've got uh, for, for amateur use. All the other ones are either low Earth orbit or medium Earth orbit, so they're only um, reachable part of the time. And they've got a different footprint every time they orbit the Earth, so they're not, not constant. It started in 2012 <clears throat> when AMSAT-DL had a meeting in Qatar with the Qatari Amateur Radio Society at the International Amateur Radio Festival. 2013, there were several meetings then from the idea to the finalization of the requirements. And then with those requirements, amateur and obviously the commercial ones as well, this went um, to Mitsubishi Electric, Melco in Japan, who built the satellite. And then in 2018, on the 15th of November, it was launched with the SpaceX rocket. Went into its place in orbit. It went through the usual testing. 
and then um, in the 14th, on the 14th of February next year, the next year, it was then released for amateur radio use. The footprint of the satellite, um, this is the ideal footprint or the maximum theoretical footprint where you have on the edge you've got uh, zero degrees elevation. So um, on, the, on the yellow edge here, that's the edge of the footprint. And from everywhere inside, you should be able to um, work the satellite. Um, so the, the point where it is, or where it hovers over, so to speak, is um, over the Democratic Republic of Congo somewhere. And yeah, you can work from from the north, from Svalbard down to Antarctica, and from Brazil, there's some edges here, I think, Paraguay, uh, Argentina, down to Java, um, Southeast Asia. Doesn't quite reach um, Australia, and it doesn't quite reach North America, other than a bit of Greenland. Although, um, at the RSGB convention this year, they put out a challenge to work it from the edge of Newfoundland, which is just outside the footprint, the theoretical one. But um, it's not 100% because you don't know the exact position of the, of the satellite and the exact um, um, direction of the of the uh, of the antenna, so it might sway a bit to the east or the west. So it's it's a challenge. It might be possible, it might not be possible, um, but it will, I'm sure, be tried. But there's, yeah, as you can see, there's a lot of countries available. I think there's about just over 200 DXCC countries available to work over this satellite. So what can you, can you do? There's actually two transponders there. There's a narrowband transponder, um, which has a width of 500 kilohertz. So quite a sizable chunk. Um, like a fairly big um, HF band, or yeah, bigger than most HF bands apart from 10 meters. And you can do all the narrow modes, like um, single sideband, Morse, any of the digital modes, digital, slow scan TV, um, etc. There's also a multimedia beacon that they're testing, um, sending some um, data like cluster information, the X News, etc. So that's a narrow band transponder, and then there's also a wide band transponder, which is 8 megahertz altogether, um, which is used for digital television, DVB-S2 standard. The normal television systems would, would be 8 or 10 megahertz wide um, with the full resolution that you get on, on your uh, television. They use smaller bandwidth, obviously with a little less quality, but still for amateur use, perfect enough. So there's um, a lot that you can hear and also work on the satellite. I've only done narrow band, so we will only cover this here. Um, 
for the frequencies that you need. So you need to transmit on this 13 centimeter band, 2.4 gigahertz. That's the uplink. And you receive the signals on 3 centimeters, 10.489 gigahertz. That's where the uh, transponder um, transmits. That's the band plan of the, of the narrow band transponder, similar to one of the, um, of the HF bands or VHF bands. So you've got the beacon at the bottom, which is um, on 10.489.500. Then you've got the CW area at the bottom, digital modes. Narrow band like FD4, FD8, that sort of thing at the bottom. More wide uh, digital modes like slow scan TV above that. You've got a single sideband, quite a lot, with the uh, PSK beacon in the middle. And then you've got mixed modes at the top and another uh, beacon plus the multimedia beacon at the um at the top the beacons are actually pseudo beacons so they're not sent directly from the satellite they're actually going via the transponder from the ground station in bochum in germany if you want to have a listen yourself you can do that on the internet. So there's one in the UK at the uh, Goonhilly uh, station in Cornwall. Oops. Um, so that's your, the, this URL um, for the narrowband transponder. And you, can, you can't see pictures, but you can see the spectrum of the wideband transponder there. So you can see if there's any signals there that you might want to tune into. And there's another web SDR on Sicily. There might be others, but these are the ones that I'm aware of. Okay, so maybe you've now decided you want to get on the satellite. What do you need as equipment? So we've got two different bands that we need. The 2.4 gigahertz uplink and the, the 10 gigahertz downlink, which is different equipment. You want a full duplex um, possibility that's actually recommended by the operating guidelines or you, you should have it according to the guidelines. So if you have one of those um, satellite capable radios that have a full duplex where you receive in one band and transmit on another band, you can use that. So most commonly nowadays possibly is the IC9700 from ICOM, the new one. They've got an older uh, one as well. Kenwood TS2000 or Yezu FD847. I'm sure there's, there's other options there. Or you can have a separate transmitter and receiver, of course. And the same goes for the antenna. You can either have separate antennas or you can have some sort of a dual band antenna. So let's start with the antennas for receive. Most commonly used is a satellite dish. So one of those offset dishes like this one here. Um, any cheap um, satellite dish from your local um, satellite shop will do or you have a, an older satellite dish or 
a commercial prime focus dish. Same thing, it's only the way here you've got the bottom of the parabola, and here you've got a side bit of the parabola um, that reflect your signal, and then you have some sort of feed or receiving antenna in here that collects the reflected signal from the uh, from the surface of the dish. Or you can just go and use a horn antenna directly pointed to the satellite. Or these are also used as feeds in the dish. Then you go to the receiver. Um, again, most commonly used is a TV LNB that you know from normal satellite te television. Um, that will convert the 10.489 gigahertz to 739 megahertz. It obviously needs some sort of power, so you need a bias T to send the um, power to the, the LNB through the coax. And then you can either use an SDR receiver like here in the diagram, receiving the 739 MHz directly. Or instead of the SDR, you can uh, use some sort of converter that converts it to a amateur band, and then you use your normal amateur receiver for that. There's multiple options as well to modify this. So some people have had success. Um, so. The, the uh, local oscillator for this is 9.75 gigahertz to mix this. And some people have modified their LNBs to use a different frequency and mix it directly to 70 cents or 23 cents. And of course, on the, on the receiving of 739 megahertz or converting that, there's lots of options that you have as well. So that's your receive side, and if you use an SDR, and you have a picture like that in a white um, scan of the band, and you see the trans oops, transponder noise, so you see there's a bit more noise here around the area between the beacons, then you don't need any more signal from your antenna, from your receiver you receive anything that will go uh, that will come over the transponder so that's a, a test so to speak if your receiving equipment is is good enough or you can still improve on it the transmitter again several options Use a our mode a receiver uh, or rather a transmitter and an up converter. For example, from 70 centimeters to 2.4 gigahertz or 2 meters or, or 23 sums. Or you can use an HF radio with two up converters. So for example, from 10 to 70 centimeters, and then you use another one from 70 centimeters to 2.4 gigahertz. There are ones yet that allow you to go directly from 28 to 2.4, but you have to be sure that you are filtering well enough because your local oscillator and also uh, the mirror frequency is relatively close to your um, receive frequency. So 24 plus or minus 28 is inside most filters. 
So you have to be careful that you don't transmit out of band, etc. That's the conventional, so to speak, um, transmitter. And the other option is then to use a software-defined radio. For example, the analog de devices, Ada and Pluto, advanced learning module, they call it. So it's a, a tool to learn about um, SDR technology, mainly for Wi-Fi and, and 4G, 5G, etc. But works perfectly for our um, purposes as well. Or there's the Lime SDR, or there's other uh, SDRs available that allow you to transmit. And they can then transmit directly on 2.4 gigahertz with low power. And then, of course, you need an amplifier to get the signal up to um, the strength that you need to get over the satellite. So if you've got a good antenna, you might be okay with 100 milliwatts, um, but with 20 watts, you should get over the satellite with the smallest of antennas. So the pictures here, this is the Pluto with uh, transmit and receive connection. It's got USB at the bottom. Uh, so you can connect it to your PC and then use software to um, receive and transmit with it. This is a um, probably an up converter or it could be well it should be an up converter because it's on the transmit slide um from the X Patrol from Portugal so they produce things like that but there's others available this SG Labs in Bulgaria that do a 2.4 gigahertz transverter from 70 sums um there's Kuhner in Germany, there's Pilberling if you've got lots of money, um, etc. So there's options where you convert yourself, of course. And then finally, this is um, an SG Labs 20 watt linear amplifier. So that's the transmitter, and then you need, of course, a transmit antenna as well. Um, the satellite downlink is vertically polarized for the narrow band, so you just need a linear antenna, but the uplink is circularly polarized, so um, you need some sort of circular polarization from your antenna. Um, so you can use a helix directly, one like that. That gets you maximum about 18 dB gain. Or you can use a Wi-Fi grid antenna like this. Um, they get, get you 24 dB. It's only linear polarization, so you lose 3 dB again against circular. Then there's something called a patch feed, which is basically um, a metal plate in front of a reflector, and the edges of the metal plate act as dipoles, and by placing the feet and cutting corners on the on the metal, um, you um, achieve circular polarization. Um, one of them is called patch of the year, potty. That's quite a popular feat. That's this one down here. Um, that's by G. 0MGWPA3FYW and M0EYT. They created it one year and then called it Patch of the Year. I don't think it's a, um official 
um, um, a vault that they got. <laughs> or you can have a helix feed like this um, in the dish. So instead of the patch feed, like in this picture, you have this bit. Um, there you have to be careful. You have to transmit right-hand circular polarization, but the dish will um, change the polarization sense, so you need a left-hand circular feed for your dish. Easy mistake to make, and then you wonder why you're very weak. Okay, that's transmit antennas. And you can see with um, the, the potty feed here and with the helix, you can combine that with an LNB. Um, here, there's an LN, no, it's probably not mounted at the moment, but you could just mount an LNB at the bottom here. So they are dual band antenna, so you only need one dish for receive and transmit. Software, if you're receiving and or transmitting, for receiving you can use, of course, any SDR software like SDR uh, Sharp, SDR Uno, HG, SDR, SDR console. And that is very good as well if you want to transmit um, because it's got the, the transmit option. And also it's got a special feature for QR100. So the um, beacon, if you remember in the band plan, there was a PSK beacon in the middle. Um, that should be exactly on 10489.750. And you can set up the console with this little window here. Um, it finds the frequency of the beacon once you point it to it, if it's too far off. And it will then uh, adjust the displayed frequency so that you actually see it on, on the middle of the band. So here you see a, a screenshot that was at some point that finds the beacon on, instead of 750, it finds it on 749.796, so that's 204 hertz off. And that's even though the beacon and my receiver are GPS disciplined. And the reason is that the local oscillator on the satellite is not exactly on the frequency. And there's also some Doppler shift because even though it says stationary, the satellite has to do maneuvers to keep in position. Um, so it moves in the sort of figure eight uh, a few kilometers around its, its um, position. At the moment, um, the shift is about 150 hertz or so. It depends a bit on of day if there's sun on the satellite or not and time of year as well how much sun they get um, that um, changes the frequency of the local oscillator on the on the uh, satellite so you get different results Right. Um, are there any questions on the um, things that we've covered so far, like the equipment, etc.? I have to wave. I think everyone's got a question. 
Kırışıt. All right to go? Yeah. yeah. Um, just a couple of things. Um, firstly, with the... I mean, I was at the convention um, when they were talking about getting um, uh, signals possibly from Nova Scotia or Newfoundland or wherever it was. Uh, Presumably, because because the sun, the the footprint does move a little bit with the, you know, because the Earth isn't completely uh, spherical. I think um, due to those some times where that sort of moves into goes into Newfoundland. Um, but I well, I suppose I suppose that will be the case. I don't know any numbers or whatever how much it is. But there's also uh, propagation, of course. So I worked a station in Brazil that was very close to zero degrees, so it was inside the footprint. But there, there was very deep, slow QSB between uh, allowed as nine, so to speak, signal and and nearly nothing. So it's yeah, it is tropo, yeah. Yeah, there, there is a station on. There is a station on traveling through uh, Laos this week, and he's operating within within a fraction of a degree. And uh, sometimes he's S nine, and sometimes he's barely there. And of course, there have been stations in Indonesia operating at minus one degrees. They were fun to work. Very very slow QSB, yep. and every time it rained or whatever, they disappeared. Yeah, exactly. Yes, um, they will come up in the presentation as well. <laughs> oh, sorry. Don, and no worries. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I worked um, at the station in Laos as well, went from two locations so far. Um, also confirmed on Lockbrook of the World already, so. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, a very good operation, that. Okay, uh, any more questions? Did you have another one? Yeah, I'm yeah, yeah, just regard, regarding the, um, the uh, where you're supposed to have duplex. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, if you don't have one of those rigs, I mean, could you, I, I presume you could just use the SDR from Goon Hillary or something like that to, to uh, as your sort of de facto duplex, I guess. No, certainly. Um, Give you the option or to to um, monitor your own signal over the transponder, um, or you can just use an SDR locally and uh, I I in addition to to your normal radio that you're using. Can I ask something? Yes. Uh, how are you to as regards um, events and uses here for ease of operation, I was looking at the uh, uh, yes, station and also the dish with the uh, LMB with the uh, or the the potty antenna uh, for a quick for a quick setup. Um, yeah, certainly the the ground station I'm sure will work. Uh, I think they've got a new one that's got duplex capability. Right, yes, right, yes, yes. And um, I don't have any experience with those. I've got some uh, DX Patrol stuff. Um, there you go. Peter's got one. There's one. Right. Is that the duplex? This is an old one. This is the simplex one. So you can ah, make yep. it duplex very easily by using the separate receive converter. Yeah. Which is what I do for, for portable stations. Yeah, and also, of course, um, if you want to do duplex, um, your your radio needs to support it as well, unless you have a SDR. Yeah. I started using this simplex one with an Icon 8700, or for that matter, an 847. And as I say, it's very easy to do the wiring so that you uh, you end up with a separate receive converter so you can use it full duplex. Uh, and it's much cheaper than the 350 euros difference in the price. Right. right. <laughs> right. 
Okay. And uh, yeah, the Poti or, or Helix and so there's no difference in setting it up, so it's just as easy. I mean, even, obviously, if you build the, the Helix yourself or the Poti yourself, you have to uh, adjust it yourself. Um, but I guess that's also more or less the same effort for both. Okay. I, sh I should say there, Carlton, the um, the the original ground station, very the simplex one, very conveniently has a ten meg output on the back. So you can actually take that 10 meg and use it to stabilize your receive converter, even when you're not using that's the down converter, even when you're not using the one inside the box. Yeah, yeah, that's that's possible, yeah. Okay. So there's there's lots of options as you can hear. Um which is part of the fun. So you, yeah. anybody you work has a slightly different station. So it's nice to to talk about what you did yourself and what others did. Talking about that, um, this is my station that I've got at the moment. Um, so. I didn't have a um, VHF rig as such. I've got a two meter transverter, uh, but I didn't really want to use that for the satellite as well. Um, switching antennas, etc. So um, I went with the Pluto, and also that was interesting. Just transmitting with an with an SDR was something new to do. So I've got, well, where do we start? I'll start out here. I've got the Pluto receiving and transmitting. For transmit, there's a little uh, low signal amplifier also from analog devices, um, giving you about 20 dB um, uh, gain. And then I've got a amplifier from SG Labs in Bulgaria giving a maximum of 20 watts out of 2.4 gigahertz that goes up to a helix in a at the moment one meter offset dish and for receiving I could of course receive directly with the Pluto but because I was ordering a um, LNB from AMSAT DL anyway, um, I went for the AMSAT DL down converter, which has a GPS antenna import and then gives me 25 megahertz for the LNB. It gives me a 40 megahertz output for the Pluto. So that's also. GPS disciplined, um, and of course it's got 14 volts or 18 volts for the LNB for receive. It's also got, actually, if you use it with the um, AMSAT DL LNB, you can use both ports or on this twin LNB. You could uh, receive wide band and low band at the at the same time. And then uh, from the down converter, that's converting it to two meters, and that's what I'm receiving with the SDR. That's all in a box, which is on the next slide, um, on a little mast. Um, and connections are just an Ethernet connection to my PC and also 12 volts. Could do that with PoE as well, but I've just got a cable down out there. So that's um, the first in uh, the first version of the dish that was a bit smaller than the meters. 
and the first version of the helix with um, with the LNB. That's this one here. I don't know if you can see that uh, on the table. Um, there's no closer photo, and this is a box with um, all the equipment in it. There's a 28 volts power supply for the amplifier and 5 volt for that little preamp here. Um, this is the Pluto built into a, a metal box and this is the AMSAT DL down converter all connected with cables and there's some attenuators there as well put in a box up there just over the roof of the little outbuilding in our garden and beaming southeast to the uh, satellite. How I got here? Well, somebody mentioned QO100 on one of our calls. I think it was you, Peter. Um, so I had no VHF transceiver that I could use. So I decided to go the SDR route. Um, went and bought the, the SDR, the down converter and the LNB. A dish from Kamsat in sale. And now receive should, in theory, be easy, shouldn't it? <laughs> Right, so I installed the dish and the LNB on the mast, finished the down converter kit, connected it all together, um, not yet in that box, finding the satellite. Right, that took a while, without success, until I found that the uh, green mark on the LNB that I bought uh, on the outer plastic wasn't actually the mark for the reference input. It was the other one. <laughs> <laughs> um, they were marked inside the plastic box. Um, but yeah, I couldn't obviously see that from the outside. So that took me a while. I got uh, one of those cheap satellite finders, um, turned it to Astra 2, which is um, not very far away from the position for um, for QA 100 or SRSAT, and then just moved it two degrees uh, as it east and one degree. Uh, elevation less and yeah finally with the correct connections I found the satellite and I could receive it. Great! Then the satellite looking at the CW beacon it sounded like an old Russian transmitter moving you heard around but I'm GPS disciplined that's just not possible well you have to remember you have 9.75 gigahertz in LO um, the local oscillator in the LNB and the way that's produced is by having 25 megahertz either in a quartz or um, other oscillator or uh, the GPS oscillator and then it's modifi uh, multiplied by 390 to get the 9.75 gigahertz. So every hertz you're off 25 megahertz um, is 390 hertz in on receive and you can hear a lot less than that. So, yeah, but I still thought I'm GPS disciplined. But obviously, I didn't have the down converter in a box 
and it's got a very slow um, regulation time constant. So every time somebody passed, walked, walked past the down converter or moved, made some wind, the TCXO that was this uh, GPS discipline, but slowly uh, went off frequency and then um, was caught again by the GPS and went back to the correct frequency. Um, I found that finally on the AMSAT DL forum because other people had the same issue before. Uh, the solution, if you, if it's not in the box, just put some foam on the TCXO on the board, stick it on with some tape, and now you've got a constant frequency of the beacon. So that was another lesson learned. Right, that was a receive now. I wanted to transmit. Um, so for the feed, I tried the helix, the, the, the um, paper roll that you get in wrapping paper, just the season now, um, is a great winding call for your helix. Then I needed to put a end connector on a copper plate. But freehand drilling of four holes with uh, in a square with another hole in the center of those four didn't quite work out. So there was a lot of filing to be done. <laughs> and then, of course, I wanted to solder it, but yeah, uh, thick copper isn't easy to sh solder. Um, again, I've not done big things like that and try to solder them before so that was something new as well so another lesson learned but it was all good fun then um, I had bought this LNB but of course I wanted to maybe try myself um, but yeah, that's difficult because it's very small. So this is a standard LNB. Um, and this is, it's not the same, but this is the inside of it. So this is the AMSAT DL LNB. There used to be a quartz here. And then there is a 25 megahertz bandpass put in instead, connected to the input and also the uh, the choke there is modified so um, that the 25 megahertz actually gets through the signal and isn't, isn't uh, grounded. So that's the, the original AMSA DI one that I made. I've, I'm not going to show photos of those. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is, I mean, you've all seen an LNB, what they look like um, with the plastic cover on. This is what it looks like with the, with the cover off. The electronics is underneath this bit. Here's the connections. A little horn uh, for the 10 gigahertz. Uh, or rather, um, waveguide and then the horn at the end here. So this is looking into it. And you can see the um, feed. Um, probes uh, in, in there, one for vertical and one for horizontal. Um, I don't know how to get to the other monitor. <laughs> there we go. Right. Okay, so yeah, interesting to 
do all these things that I, at least I didn't do before. So, a lot was learned in the process. So then, we can have a look at operating. That doesn't now work, because I'm not focused on the presentation anymore. Is it right? Is it left? Left. So, first QSO I had was in April with 701 India Sierra from Saudi Arabia. As of last week, or this week, I'm not sure, I've worked 95 countries, and there's a few that got away as well. Some highlights, Antarctica, oops, DP0, GVN, <coughs> Iran, Santelina, Christmas Island, and today, and also on the weekend, I think it was, Laos. So there's a lot of DX activity also from Africa. There's a lot that I've worked, South America, and uh, yeah, India is quite active as well. There's quite a lot of people that go to the expeditions or multiple activations, activating new squares. So I'm not sure if everybody's aware of Maidenhead locators, this six digit code that we use to um, um, exchange our location, um, made of two letters, two numbers, and then again two letters. Um, for example, my home locator is India Oscar 83 Tango Kilo and squares um, are the first two letters and then the two numbers, so IO83. And there's awards that you can get or you can just collect them for yourself. Try to fill your map with all those little squares. So that's interesting, lots of DX, one way or the other, to be had on the satellite. And of course, a lot of technical talks. Um, everybody's got a slightly different setup, as we've said. Um, and from that, there's a lot of interesting conversations that you have. Um, what's interesting, for example, um, Mr. Hilberling is quite a lot um, after midnight German time on uh, 7.04, they've got a net there, and he was um, um, telling his colleagues all the steps of, this, of his development of the multi-transverter that came out on, uh, on this year's ham radio. So that was, that was interesting. <laughs> Um, and he's, he's also quite funny, so, um, yeah, that was good to, to listen to. Um, that was pretty much it for the talk, but if you want to do some minimalist operating, these pictures are from Twitter, 9A stroke DJ4FF portable, just a little loop and an LNB pointed at the satellite 5 watts and you can work the um, FT4 or FT8 uh, work the world. And the other in the same station that was just recently the um, new pizza box antenna. <laughs> so basically it's the, the same loop inside this pizza box with aluminium foil I guess as a um as a reflector 
all works. Good, so that's how I got there and what I'm doing. Next step, um, maybe get some portable setup myself. Um, I've only been doing sideband with the Pluto. Of course, I'm really a CW operator, so I want to do CW. Um, I've done a little bit of uh, audio set into the microphone or uh, from an application on the PC, but that's not really um, nice operating. So there's a project I found for a CW key, we're uh, programmed in Arduino that plugs in and um, registers itself as a sound card on the PC. Uh, so that could be your microphone, and then you uh, connect paddles to it, and you can do CW with low latency into um, SDR console, hopefully. Again, together with the portable setup, or um, just for at home, there's this delay you get a little bit with an SDR. So, do I want to invest in a conventional radio? Maybe next year, if I get a bonus, might buy the IC9700. And something I've looked at but not really followed up and only marginal interest in is, is the um, television side of things. Might do something on receive, but unlikely to do anything on, on transmit with that. You need a bit more power as well, which then means modifying a UMTS or 4G amplifier or um, linear use etc not sure if that's not above my capabilities i don't know right that was it for me any further questions comments etc Just a note that if any, anybody wants to ask any questions, you'll need to unmute yourself. Just for now, the DXCC, uh, so what, what's, the, what's the process there? If you get, say, um, you work someone on sideband or whatever, is it, how does that manifest itself? Um, there was a satellite DXCC. Um, which is not limited to QR100, but you can do it with the with the other um, satellites as well, um, where you have as a propagation mode, so to speak, um, the satellite mentioned, and then you specify which satellite it is, like QR100 in this case, and you specify your transmit frequency. And then you can just upload it to, say, Log of the World, just uh, as normal and get it confirmed. And then once you've got the 100 confirmations or 100 countries confirmed, you can um, apply for, for the DXCC or for the, um, what's it called? <coughs> the... Yeah, that's the DXCC. I meant the... Um, the UCC. Yeah, the UCC, that's it. Yeah, the, the square hunting um, award. I think the minimum you need there is 150 or something. Um, but obviously, there's a lot more available. And yeah, normal QSL cards, obviously, as well. Do you get much drift? Do you see the station drift a bit? Um, yes, yeah, some stations do, if they're not, if their oscillators are not locked very well. But you can, you can work around it. 
You'll know that you're not sick, well, it's just like a normal sideband signal, and then if you notice that the next over there moved away, you just use the red or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. FT4 and FT8 are a very good test of your stability. Yeah. Yeah. Just a second, with the, the old phase lock loops, there used to be some sort of, sort of indication whether you, uh, an LED would go off if you're out of sync or something like that. All right. When we started coming in, they weren't that good. It was just fun to get folks to put the. All right, on your own, you mean? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, no, there's no indication normally. Carsten, is there any indication that um, there's likely to be any length to this satellite? You know, as how long it will last, or as to whether there might be other processes or programs in place to put something up to allow people like the Americans, etc., to have a go at maybe another satellite. Um, so the lifespan of a, the normal television satellite, which this one is, is like ten to fifteen years, I think. So there's a few more years available, and I don't think there's any plans or options at the moment um, for another satellite. It's just a lucky, um, um, yeah, just luck that they have the opportunity to do that with the with the Qataris. Yeah, I don't know if they've got anything concrete. I mean, the, the satellites, non-geostationary, there's obviously loads of them, but um, anything like this, I'm not sure if there's anything. It's, the Qatari one is just very, very clever engineering and integration in that uh, they've they've used the technology that's in use for the in the rest of the satellite basically traveling wave tube power amplifiers and everything uh i'm not sure i did read somewhere that there is a little bit of jeopardy possibly in that these satellites always carry several um spare uh transponders and in fact what we're actually using is one of the spare transponders whether that's true or not i'm not entirely sure but i know it's very similar to what's in there so basically if they get a failure elsewhere on the spacecraft or for that matter if they get a power issue then we might go but it's very very unlikely i think yeah i think it's not actually as i think there was a rumor or whatever going around that it was a spare but i'm the deal of i think said it's not a spare even though it shares the technology um well that's good yeah I, th I think so i mean i don't know maybe the amplifiers i don't know if they would be used if something else breaks yeah because th there was an article about why on earth we were using twts rather than uh uh, solid state stuff, and the answer was because that's what broadcast satellites use. Yeah. Could this be a flash in the pan, you know, using that or, or lose it once it's gone, it's gone? I think so. Once it's gone, I don't think, well, you never know, but I mean, there was a long planning on 2012 to 2019 when it was on the air, so it would have to be starting sometime now to replace it. So I think um, once it's up, once it's up, you, if you're interested, should use it. Uh, there's no guarantee. In fact, it's probably unlikely that there is a replacement, at least a one-to-one -one replacement. AMSAT North America have had outlined plans and wishes and desires for a phase four satellite, in other words, a geostationary, for decades. 
uh, but it never came to anything because even America uh, couldn't pull it all together. It needs uh, a lot of dedication and a lot of money to pull together an amateur application on a geostationary satellite. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I guess, I, I, I guess um, you know, uh, we ought to be supporting the World Cup. The Qataris did this well. That, that that was going to be my point about the World Cup to some extent because that, it was all on the back of that, wasn't it? Well, it was. Uh, this specifically wasn't, but certainly the friendships were. And uh, ham radio is a very very big thing in Qatar as well. There are dozens of them on six meters and lots on the satellite as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh -huh. So, what was the cost of the satellite? Your, your oh, my station. Oh, um, don't ask. <laughs> um, it was. It, I bought quite a few things around it, like tools that I didn't have, and some things twice. Um. But the station as it's up there was maybe about eight hundred pounds. It de it depends where you start, I guess. I mean, I had an old FT eight. I had an old FT eight four seven sitting in the shack here, uh, getting occasional use uh, because I couldn't bear to sell it. It's just such a brilliant rig, uh, and so my. Um, additional costs for getting on the satellite initially was very, very little indeed. I had a 13 stems transverter from SG Labs, which cost originally about 180 euros, I think, when I bought it. Um, I had an old sky dish. So my initial QSOs, which I swore I was never going to do all of this, I've been a life, an AMSAT Life member for 40 years. But I haven't been on satellites for a long, long time. I got, I had other interests, but I had some friends that went off to uh, um, Botswana, and I worked them on six meters, and they were going to be on QO one hundred, and basically over the course of a rainy, wet weekend, I cobbled together an old sky dish, an old LNB, my thirteen SEMS transverter, and the FT eight four seven, and worked them. That was going to be the end of my satellite activity, but I got hooked, didn't I? And I've spent a lot more since then on lots of other things. That's the way it goes. Yeah. Peter, what's what, what's your portable setup like? Because I know we've seen you operate from uh, is it uh, GB2LD, the Lizard. Yes. What, what what kind of portable setup do you use? All right, I, I've. I've got I've actually got two I've actually got two setups because I was involved in the early development of the DX patrol. I didn't do anything. I just tried one and got one early. Um, but I've got one simple station that uses the DX patrol and what have you. My main station that I use is the one point uh, one point. I think it's about one point one meter offset dish. Actually, the big thing that you've seen me standing by. Um, an SG Labs 20 watts PA, which is hardly running uh, with that dish. Um, it's all it's all basically analog. Uh, well, that's not true actually, because it's an SDR radio. I use an I use um, an IC9700, which is where the money got spent. But that was bought for other things as well. That's a satellite radio like the FT847. Um, and so I run full duplex. So that's a long answer to your question. It's basically a fairly biggish dish, a PA, um, an SG Labs transverter, and um, all of that lot is GPS locked um, via. Um, um, it's not a Leo Bodnar GPS thing that I've got, but it's a, a similar kind of thing. Um, I've actually got once you do this, you find you've got lots and lots of options. I haven't gone down the um, analog devices Pluto thing route yet. 
a because they're expensive and b because that's not where my skills are i'd rather do uh, messing around with analog circuits so you know really an old satellite dish an old lnb um will get you going or even a 13 sems transverter and any old radio uh and using goon hilly sdr will get you going and so you can you can spend very very little and still have some good qso's um or you can spend the sky's the limit i i thought uh, well there's a couple of german manufacturers who uh, make stuff that you could probably buy a house for or at least pay the mortgage for a long time Yeah, that's great, Peter. I, I did wonder why you got a big camper van, but I suppose now you've answered the question. <laughs> in the sense that that's where the uh, that's where all the gear goes in. But that that's great. Uh, okay, uh, any more questions? Peter, we need to work. Um, I've I still need IO seventy. I think I've got you from the from the lizard with IN seventy nine. I don't have IO seventy. Oh well. Um, and yeah, any time you'll find me on. I didn't realise that. I know we'd work from the lizard. I didn't know we hadn't worked from here. Um, yeah, um, I. Uh, oh no, I can't. It's in the car. I was going to say I'll give you remote access to my station, and you can talk to yourself then. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but we we can we can work any time on you. Um, you also work FT8, don't you? Uh, not on satellite. Um... Okay, no worries. We'll. We can work on SSB. I'm just listening who's on here. Uh, yeah, no, uh, well, I, I can probably do it. I, I, I've got some issues, I think, because I've got a flex radio, and I think it doesn't like the the uh, virtual um, audio stuff. Ah. I've had some issues with that, so that's why I haven't tried um, FD4, FD8. Okay. Well, no problem. I'm sure we'll bump into each other or you can text message me or what have you. Um, if you're around tomorrow evening, um, I'll be running QO100 live somewhere from around 8.15, 8.30 from IO70. It may be my call sign. It may be somebody else's call sign. Um, but I'm, I'm actually taking the stuff and parking it in the car park of the Callington Amateur Radio Society. I did a a survey at last at the last meeting and i can just about see the satellite over the roofs of the uh, the buildings in the center of Carrington. so uh, i i hopefully will be on tomorrow night on ssb um and you can probably work half a dozen stations actually because no doubt everyone will want to have a go well i'm certainly gonna have a listen yeah and that, that goes to anyone else you can listen on uh, listen on the goon hilly uh, web sdr of course and um, yeah, I'm just listening to somebody very loud here at the moment. I don't know who he is. Oh, he's Italian. <laughs> he's the yeah, way over S9 on QO100. Anyway, thank everywhere. you very much, Carsten. That was actually very interesting. It's always interesting to hear what other people are doing and uh, all the various options. Yeah, sure. That was, uh, yeah, it was fun putting it together as well. So, Peter, Peter, we said you were going live. Does that mean you're going live on the internet somewhere? Uh, well, in theory, yes. I'm not doing it. Um, what, what we're doing, I'm giving a, a real live physical demonstration at the radio club. But there is a there is a, there is a virtual club in Cornwall called um, Cornwall Radio Operators Club. And we've turned the meeting open to them as well. And one of their guys is coming down and doing a Zoom presentation from the club. Um, so we're not entirely sure how it's going to work. We had a very successful one a few weeks ago, um, but that was a straight presentation like this one that Carsten's done. What he reckons he's going to do tomorrow um is patch it patch everything together and will not i'll be giving a presentation like this but after that we'll be doing some live qso's on qo 100 for members physically at the club uh and we're hoping with 
you know, a handheld camera and what have you to do all of that lot over Zoom as well. But I'm having nothing to do with that because I'm going to be busy enough already. So it may or may not work, but it is unfortunately at the moment a members only of that club, though it will be, I'm pretty sure, recorded. And when it is, I'll let you know. When it's available, I'll let you know. Make sure you take the hot water bottle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, yeah. that, that's, a, that's in my planning for today. I've seen the weather forecast for tomorrow, and I know I've got to leave a fire door open to take the coax outside to the dish because I don't use uh, 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 an Ethernet feed. Everything's, uh, you know, there's, there's three coax feeds and a power supply, basically. Um, so I've got to leave the fire door open. So it could be a very short talk if the weather forecast uh, gets any worse. Don't forget the uh, head flask as well, because that might come in handy. Yes, got one of those. <laughs> a, nice, a nice shiny metal one, so we can warm it with RF. Very good, very good, very good. Uh, thanks for that, Peter. And I'm, I'm sure that uh, if when you're getting close to uh, being on the satellite, if you post a message across the well, you usually post across Facebook, don't you? I'm sure we'll uh, pick up on that and may, maybe give it a sh give it a listen. Of course, that Castle will tune in as well. Of course, so uh, that, 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 that that's great hearing another perspective of it as well at the same time. So uh, thank you for that, Peter. And, yeah. and uh, it's strange, strange how two things coming together at virtually the same week about the same subject as well. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? It's um, and uh, it's it's going to be pretty much a repeat of what Carsten's done, but from. Uh, from the analog side rather than the Pluto side, um, and uh, yeah, be, be good fun anyway. And if we can get a QSO uh, with you, Carsten, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, have a listen and uh, what do you get you? Yeah, yeah, just leave it running and stay in the bar. We'll do, we'll do this all by telepathy, shall we? Uh, telepathy, shall we? But anyway, yeah. so that's a good story. Right, okay. Any more questions from, uh, from the floor? If, if, if there are, you'll need to unmute yourself. Okay, I'm not seeing anything coming on, so I'd like to say thank you very much once again to uh, uh, Carsten for coming down and giving us an excellent talk. And I know you can't all clap there, but we're going to clap in the in the in Walter House here. But uh, remember, there is the uh, button where you can raise your hand and show a clap. So thank you very much again, Carsten. Nice to see you, and thanks for a great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll go enjoy enjoy the chocolates that Carsten has brought. So we're going to show you. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. Guys. Thanks, 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 Carson. Enjoyed that very much. Very good. Carson. Got a very nice picture of a helical feed with the LMB behind it there. Another. All oh, right. There it is. Very nice. Was that your Megan Carson? Did you make that one, Carson? No. Oh. Very quiet. His lips are moving, but I can't hear anything. Yeah, yeah. I've got I've, I've not got the microphone anymore. Now I've got echo. All right. You made you you made that one. Very good. Yeah. 
I have a feet. Anybody wants a anybody wants a chocolate by this chance? You know, well, there's plenty of chocolate. To <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'm going to offer them up to you, right? But you can't. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure all the guys here will say they're very nice, aren't they? They're very nice. No, we have a vet, we'll have a vetual chocolate. Absolutely good. <laughs> yeah. They would warm up quite nicely in front of the dish as well. Would you like one? Would you like one, Peter? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Anyway, did the uh, system work all right tonight? Unlike uh, yes. last time. Yes. Yes. It did. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Good. And, and, and I see John managed to get in. Uh, well, yes, indeed. Yes, I was pleased. Yeah. Yeah. Did. Uh, nice did to see you again, hope, John. I hope none of you got any warnings like Peter did. Uh, when Peter uh, tried to get, get details of the meeting, they got some strange warning from Norton. Oh. <laughs> yeah, saying the the site was uh, the site was infected and a, a known malicious site. Don't enter. Oh my <laughs> goodness! I'm not surprised with all these chocolates around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's anyway. nice. It's nice to know the system works. And just yeah, a reminder, yeah. of course, right, the next yeah. meeting is the AGM, isn't it? Uh, which is in two weeks' time. So, right. Uh, you know, uh, we'll, we'll we'll do it all again. Not quite this kind of thing, but we'll be doing it again. Uh, uh, right. Online, so uh, any items for any bit other business, please get them to us ASAP. Yeah. And if you want to nominate yourself or anybody else your committee, again, please get to it. I've been giving two microphones. Now. I've only got two eat. I've only got one man. Right, hey fellas, I've got to go and eat. So I'll say cheers. Yeah. I'm out here as well, putting the kettle on. Good night, all. Thank you. Okay. Cheers. Right. Cheers. See you Until next time. Cheers. See you later.